Hello viewers and welcome to another episode of Elections by Numbers. Today we're talking about the Tar Heel State, North Carolina. The town of Asheville in the, uh, the western part of the state in the mountains of North Carolina has the largest home in the entire country called the Biltmore Estate. It has 255 rooms, a winery, and extensive gardens surrounding the property. On the opposite side of the state, the coast of North Carolina was frequently terrorized by famed pirate Edward Teach, aka Blackbeard, who would allegedly light his beard on fire during battles to intimidate his opponents. The first flight ever recorded also took place near the town of Kitty Hawk, uh, which is also in coastal North Carolina. It occurred on December 17th, 1903, was manned by Orville Wright of the Wright Brothers, and lasted approximately 12 seconds. North Carolina has 13 congressional house districts, and the current balance of power is nine Republicans to three Democrats to one vacancy. And actually, North Carolina's congressional districts have been redrawn since the most recent election, uh, midterm election, in 2018 to deal with partisan overreach in the state that had, that had been occurring for years um, that benefited Republicans heavily. And the new resulting map is so effective uh, uh, in a way that uh, two Republicans are actually not running for re-election this cycle because their districts have changed so dramatically demographically since the redrawing and they hold very little hope of, of retaining their seat in their new uh, more democratic districts. We'll talk about those and others uh, after we look at a line graph to see how North Carolinians have been voting for their representatives over the last decade. So looking at this line graph, you'll see a very competitive state indeed with the expected ups during presidential years and the dips in midterm years, with Republicans breaking away as did many states uh, uh, in 2014, which was a very good year for, for uh, congressional uh, Republicans running across the country. And that advantage was held on to through 2016 as well when Donald Trump carried the state. And when you look at how close these turnout values are between parties, you'll really begin to understand how gerrymandered the state truly was until very recently. When you can have turnout numbers this close to each other, but in the end you have 10 Republicans to three Democrats representing across the state, you have a problem with gerrymandering. And that's exactly what they were addressing uh, when they uh, recently redrew the maps and why two Republicans have decided to not run this year because they looked at their new constituents and thought, uh, this doesn't look too good. So we'll see if the new maps really do make a difference like uh, some of these uh, Republicans think they will. Now, uh, let's toss that graph aside. And uh, there's five districts I want to bring to your attention from North Carolina today. And they are North Carolina's second, sixth, 8th, 9th, and 11th. Now, Districts 2 and 6 are actually the ones where uh, Republicans have decided to retire rather than run for another term because the way they're drawn now, I mean, North Carolina's second covers uh, a lot of Raleigh and Cary, I believe, a sort of a suburb of Raleigh. And North Carolina's six covers uh, Greensboro and Winston-Salem, if I'm not mistaken, um, all pretty rural, or excuse me, pretty urban areas uh, relative to the rest of the state. Because of how competitive uh, the state has been statewide, uh, I do believe the second and the sixth will flip to Democratic control. They're both currently represented by Republicans, but after November, I don't believe that will be the case any longer. North Carolina's eighth and ninth are in the uh, more southern central part of the state. Uh, North Carolina's ninth is actually uh, covers some southern suburbs of uh, outside of Charlotte and was considered competitive pretty recently when Dan Bishop won his first term in the area. I do believe he will go on to another term uh, this year, along with the Republican from North Carolina's 8th. And lastly, North Carolina's 11th is the uh, the vacancy right now in the westernmost part of the state covering the mountains, formerly represented by a Republican. And I do believe uh, uh, Republican candidate Madison Cawthorn will be the victor in that race as well. He's only 25 years old, so he, he would be one of the youngest, perhaps the youngest member of Congress. I'd actually have to double check myself on that, but he's a very young man, 25 years old. Uh, and I do believe he is widely expected to win uh, the 11th district. So by my count, we have two flips in favor of Democrats in the state of North Carolina, a pretty big deal and a major consequence of redrawing uh, the congressional boundaries recently. Definitely good news for uh, state Democrats moving forward in the state. Now let's make these uh, predictions official and put them on our first map right now. Mark it. Up next, we have a Senate election in North Carolina. Incumbent Republican Senator Tom Tillis is running for a second term against Democratic challenger Cal Cunningham. This is one of the uh, more widely considered competitive uh, Senate races in the nation this year. To understand how North Carolinians have been voting for senators over the last decade, let's pull up some uh, voter turnout ratios right now. And here we're looking at some numbers that are pretty interesting, pretty revealing about the candidates themselves, actually, rather than the party they represent, if you ask me. Tom Tillis' first victory as a senatorial candidate occurred in 2014, of course, but he was at a 
uh, over 20% disadvantage in terms of these voter turnout ratios against uh, former Democratic Senator Kay Hagan. Nevertheless, he was able to pull through in 2014 by only 1.5% margin of victory, however. Um, neither candidate cracked 50% six years ago. Of course, 2014 was a very good year for Republicans across the country as well. But numbers like these do point to a lack of strength in uh, Tom Tillis, the candidate relative uh, to his Republican colleague, the senior uh, senator from North Carolina, Richard Burr. Burr won victories, of course, in uh, 2010 and 2016, uh, had a slight disadvantage in, uh, in uh, voter ratio in 2016. But remember, voters turned out in pretty good numbers for Republican House candidates in the state of North Carolina that year, so that was enough for him to carry the state uh, uh, for, a, I believe, a third time. Looking at numbers like these and looking ahead, one has to wonder if Tom Tillis has improved his popularity across the state or not. Uh, to get a better idea of that, we can look at his approval rating. So now let's toss those numbers aside and consider that value. It is actually at minus three right now. He has the approval of 44% uh, of North Carolinians and the disapproval of 47%. Not a good look for him, uh, coupled with uh, voter ratios like these. And with that, we have every bit of information we need to project how this could go down in November uh, between Senator Tom Tillis and Cal Cunningham uh, in the Senate race. Polbot, let's take all those figures and calculate. And there is your answer. We have projected that Cal Cunningham, the Democratic challenger, will win the Senate seat in North Carolina by about a 5.53% margin of victory, uh, continuing an 18-year tradition of uh, the junior senator in North Carolina losing after one term. This is definitely going to be one of the tighter races at the Senate level this year. Uh, so let's make this result official and put it on our senatorial map right now. Mark it. Whoa, hold on another second there, viewers. Let's toss that map aside. Today, we are able to make another major projection. With Cal Cunningham's victory in North Carolina over incumbent Republican Tom Tillis, we can now project that Democrats will take control of the U.S. Senate in 2020. So far, we've predicted uh, four flips in favor of Democrats and one in favor of Republicans. Uh, Democrats are currently down by three. They have 47 uh, seats in the Senate, if you include uh, uh, independents Bernie Sanders and Angus King. And with a projected Biden victory at the presidential level, this would mean that uh, Chuck Schumer and Senate Democrats will be able to take the majority away from Mitch McConnell and Republicans. After six years under Mitch McConnell, this is uh, certainly good news for uh, Democrats nationwide. And now let's get back to the map. Sorry for the interruption. North Carolina is also having a gubernatorial election this year. Incumbent Democratic Governor Roy Cooper is running for a second term this year against his Republican Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest. And this is actually the last gubernatorial race I will be calling in the series. So after today's prediction, we will have a final map for gubernatorial candidates. Um, to get an idea of how North Carolinians have been electing their governors, let's pull up some more voter turnout ratios right now. And looking at these, they do point to a major ideological shift uh, from Republicans to Democrats uh, over a span of four years. 2012 was a year that Pat McCrory won the governorship, was notoriously panned later on during that term for his uh, infamous bathroom bill, which made a big deal about uh, which bathrooms transgender people can use or whatnot. An issue that did not resonate too much with North Carolinians as a whole. And so uh, Roy Cooper was able to beat him four years later in 2016, certainly reflected in the uh, uh, voter turnout ratios that you can see here. It was a narrow victory for him, a very close victory. I don't expect it to be as competitive this year for him because Roy Cooper does have the incumbency advantage in North Carolina at this point. This is a pretty good look for him moving forward. Let's toss those numbers aside. Also consider the approval rating of the incumbent. In this case, it is Governor Cooper. He is actually at plus 15 points in the state right now, a very good approval rating for a governor, a Democratic governor in a you know pretty centrist state like North Carolina at this point. And now we have everything we need to make a projection for the governor's race in North Carolina. Let's give everything to Pullbot and do another calculation. Pullbot. Wow, and there is your answer. Uh, we, <laughs> we've projected uh, Roy Cooper to win a second term by a 13.69% margin of victory. This honestly, viewers might be a little high. I would not be surprised to see this value fall below 10%. Um, even kind of a, a bit below 10%. I would, closer to five would not surprise me. I think the reason that this is a pretty large margin of victory 
uh, projected here is because of the movement from 2012 to 2016 uh, that moved heavily in favor of Democrats at the governor's level. And North Carolinians do largely think that Roy Cooper is doing a fairly good job in the state, taking care of things during a pandemic with lockdowns and all that. I do expect him to win again, <clears throat> probably not by this much, but um, you know, that remains to be seen. Uh, let's make this uh, result official and put it on our gubernatorial map right now. Mark it. Now it is time to talk about the presidential election of 2020, starring President Donald Trump and Democratic challenger Joe Biden. North Carolina actually elected Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton four years ago by about a 3.7% margin of victory, and neither candidate cracked the 50% uh, barrier, meaning that a significantly uh, sizable percentage of the vote went to a third party candidate. The last time North Carolina voted for a Democratic presidential candidate actually occurred in 2008, when the state broke for Barack Obama over John McCain by point. 3%, a very close margin of victory. Side note, the presidential election in North Carolina in 2008 was the first election I ever voted in. And side note, to get an idea of how North Carolinians have been electing presidents, let's pull up some more voter turnout ratios right now. And here we're looking at some numbers that point to one of those weird cases where uh, enthusiasm actually increased going from 2012 to 2016 for Democrats and decreased uh, for Republicans going from 2012 to 2016, meaning that uh, when you look at 2012, Mitt Romney had more enthusiasm to his name uh, in North Carolina relative to all Republican House candidates than Barack Obama did to all the Democratic House candidates in North Carolina. And that really switches up in 2016 when Hillary Clinton became more popular. She received actually slightly more votes than every uh, Democratic House candidate combined in the state. And Donald Trump received just fewer. But of course, remember, there were there was a larger turnout at the House level for uh, Republicans in North Carolina. That's how Trump was able to uh, carry the state by a fairly close margin of 3.7% four years ago. This does give one the idea that the state has moved slightly left in how they elect presidential candidates. Um, so bear that in the back of your mind as we toss these numbers aside. And lastly, consider the approval rating of the incumbent. In this case, it is President Trump. He is currently sitting at minus eight points in the state. He has the approval of 45% and the disapproval of 53% of North Carolinians, leaving only 2% undecided. So all the variables point to a pretty close election in North Carolina this year as expected. Let's give everything to Polbot to calculate who is going to carry North Carolina's 15 electoral college votes this year. Polbot. And the answer to that question is Joe Biden, the Democratic challenger, winning North Carolina by a 4.57% margin of victory. Actually, this would be the widest margin of victory a Democrat has enjoyed in North Carolina since 1976. This is a pretty big projection. Trump having a negative net approval rating of uh, minus eight, certainly not a good look for him. The fact that he was less popular relative to Mitt Romney was definitely also not a good sign for him moving forward. I feel like he's done very little to change voters' minds about him even over a four year period. All reasons that uh, play into this projection we've made today that Biden will carry the state. Let's make that official and put it on our presidential map right now. Mark it. All the election results are now in for the state of North Carolina. It's a lot of good news for Democrats in the state. Two House seats flipping in favor of Democrats, a Senate seat flipping in favor of Democrats, and a presidential election flipping to Democrats uh, after having not voted that way since 2008. Let's talk briefly about the future of the state politically by pulling up an old line graph and three new ones. So first, let's take a bit of a closer look at raw house turnout numbers. Let's look specifically at slope values that you have uh, that are available in both of those equations there. Those are the values preceding X. For Republicans, it is uh, 112, and for Democrats, it is 105.7. Basically, what that means is when you take the last decade as a whole, uh, on average, every two years, uh, voters have been turning out at a rate of 112,000 more votes every two years for Republican candidates, and voters have been turning out at a rate of 105,700 votes higher for Democratic candidates every two years. So at the end of the day, we're seeing a Republican party that is breaking away on average by just about, uh, well, just under 7,000 votes every two years, which is not a whole lot for a state as populous as North Carolina is. We're also seeing here a lack of blue wave. We've seen a lot of major spikes in Democratic turnout in 2018 in a lot of states so far. New, uh, North Carolina does appear to be an exception. I do have a theory for that though. I think it is largely because uh, North Carolina, along with 
Louisiana two years ago in 2018 was, were the only two states that did not have any senatorial elections or any gubernatorial elections, meaning that voters were only turning out for House candidates. And in a state that was as historically gerrymandered as North Carolina was until recently, there seemed very little reason for a lot of voters to turn out, which kept Democratic numbers down uh, to where they are observed in this graph right here. Just a theory. I think it has some teeth to it, though. Uh, let's uh, talk briefly about these other th three line graphs now. These are basically just alternate ways to visualize how uh, those vote Voter ratios have been trending over the last decade. And as you can see in the case of senatorial candidates, gubernatorial and presidential candidates, they are all moving in favor of Democrats astoundingly. Remember, we went from uh, Pat McCrory, an unpopular Republican incumbent governor to a more popular uh, Democrat, Roy Cooper, which is the reason why the, the, gov the gubernatorial ratios are moving towards Democrats. Donald Trump was less popular than Mitt Romney was. Hillary Clinton was more popular than Barack Obama was, which is why uh, it's moving in Democrats' favor at the presidential level. And Tom Tillis did really not have a great election uh, six years ago during his first uh, his first senatorial election, even though that was a pretty good uh, Republican year nationwide. Just wasn't reflected in North Carolina as much. So three graphs here that point to pretty uh, good futures for Democrats in the state, despite the lagging numbers that we observed in 2018 for Democrats relative uh, to other states that uh, saw spikes uh, in Democratic turnout. Now, let's toss all those graphs aside. I'll give you my final consensus on North Carolina, my old stomping grounds. North Carolina is becoming more Democrat. Um, it, it's due in large part, I think, to the, the research triangle, as it's called. That includes uh, Raleigh, Durham, Cary, Chapel Hill, a lot of university towns, NC State, Duke, UNC, a lot of young people, a lot of young professionals moving to North Carolina now, uh, people that tend to skew more Democrat, drawn there by reasonable cost of living in a friendly business environment. I would not be surprised to see North Carolina begin to follow in Virginia's footsteps in like 10 years or so. Uh, you know, Virginia's pretty likely safe Democrat for the time being. Um, in 10 years time, I would not be surprised to see North Carolina sort of in lockstep with their neighbor to the north. And that just about does it for our latest episode of Elections by Numbers. I want to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in today. If you like what you saw, please hit the subscribe button to get updates on new content as it becomes available. I upload videos every Monday and Thursday. I'm also on Twitter and update that account with which state I'm covering next ahead of the scheduled release date. So if you want to stay ahead of the curve, please give me a follow on Twitter and that link is in the description. Thanks again for watching. Thank you for voting. See you next time.